Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George Ortega, and this is um, the second part of Custer's and Art's Undermine Free Will in the Journal Science. I covered, you know, the beginning of their landmark paper in this very, you know, prestigious peer-reviewed journal on the last episode. I just want to briefly outline the specifics, okay? Um, Rude Custer's and Hank Arts are psychologists uh, from Utrecht University in the Netherlands. The title of their paper is The Unconscious Will, How the Pursuit of Goals Operates Outside of Consciousness, Conscious Awareness. And I'm going to like post a link to, you can find this article actually online. I'll post a link to it on the YouTube video. Okay, and it was published on July 2nd, 2010 in the peer-reviewed journal Science. And as I mentioned in the last show, this journal is one of the top science journals in the world, one of the most prestigious in the world. It's a weekly journal, and whereas most science uh, journals cover a specific discipline in science, like physics, particle physics, or in biology, whatever, this, um, this science, this journal covers, you know, all of the different disciplines. So it's read widely, you know, that's another reason why it's important. Okay, so... Um, and basically, the research is just demonstrating that well, the, the paper is a review of the research. They're not conducting any um, new research in this. They basically review the research that demonstrates that the goals, the pursuit of goals and the creation of goals that we think that we're making consciously are actually being made at the level of the unconscious without any awareness and naturally without any control. So basically, what they're doing is they're providing, they're going through a review of of pretty much a vast amount of literature now of research that demonstrates that what we think we're consciously willing, what we think we're freely consciously deciding is actually being decided at the level of the unconscious. Okay, and again that's why John Barge of Yale Universe, uh, <laughs> University referred to it as a landmark paper, you know, uh, especially in, in being in, in the journal Science. Okay, so we went through um, the preliminaries on the last episode. Now I want to go through the priming experiments that Custer's and Arts review. Uh, and they start out with John Barge. He, you know, he's the guy that I quoted from the last episode, a Yale, Yale psychologist. And so he and colleagues um, did some research that was published in 2001 on priming. Priming is the idea that what you do is you, through various kinds of means, you, you kind of like put into a person's mind in a way that they're not aware of certain ideas that, make, that then make them respond in, in, a, in a certain way. So like for example, here's an example. All right, um, This isn't covered, I don't think, in their um, paper, but they, they wanted to study the effects of this priming on the rate of people's walking, how fast or, or slow they walk. So what they did is that they had subjects um, work on a word task, and this word task had words like elderly, cane, bingo, you know, words that, that connote being old, okay? And so like the, the subjects in this experiment, they thought that once they did their task, the experiment was over, but that was only just part one of the experiment, because like in part two, uh, what they were, what what happened was the researchers then observed them, and actually it wasn't just that group. There was another group besides them that the words that they worked with in their task did not have words that connoted being old. So that so then what happened? All right, when they noticed the two groups leaving the room, and it was in a high-rise building, they 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 observed them walking to the elevator, you know, to leave the building. And what they found was the people who had been primed, again, suggested without their awareness, with words connoting elderly, walked to, to the elevator at a much slower pace than did the, the subjects that didn't have that priming. So again, this is a perfect example of like, and, and you know, with, with this kind of research, I'm not sure if they did it with, with the elevator walk, but with others, they would ask them, well, why did you do this? Or why did you do that? And, you know, invariably the subjects are not aware that they did what they did or didn't do because of the priming 
And again, it's an important research because it demonstrates that what we're doing, what we think we're consciously, freely willing, we're actually deciding because of things that, that we're not even aware of. Okay, so like with the, with the Barge 2001 study, it was a similar kind of setup. They had uh, students in uh, several groups perform uh, two language puzzles. Okay, um, now the first, the first um, group had a puzzle that contained words like achieve and win, okay? And then the other groups, you know, didn't have that, you know, that kind of connotation in their, in their words. So what happened, um, and, and there were two tasks, right? that was the first task, all right? Then like the, the subjects of both groups, after they um, finished that first word task, then they had to do another kind of an achievement task. And so that what they found out is that the, the subjects that had been primed with words like achieve and win actually outperformed the other subjects in the second task, okay? And so, like, you know, again, like, they were debriefed after the experiment. Um, you know, Barge and, and his uh, colleagues asked the subjects, well, um, what, you know, what do you think um, made you perform as well as you did compared to the other group? Or, you know, they asked them to the account for their, um, for their behavior, or they asked them um, also, in another sense, you know, if they were aware of having been manipulated in any way, you know, in terms of, in a, a way that would affect their performance on this task and and the subjects simply they they did not show any kind of sign of being uh, aware of the priming okay um now this effect this priming effect in this study in 2001 was replicated with other kinds of words you know that for example they they used in in the word task in the first one words that connoted cooperation okay and then they found that the subjects who had been primed in that way in the second task worked together better, you know, than the subjects who hadn't been primed in that way. Then another one was um, they were primed with words that connoted occupations, you know, like different kinds of jobs. And again, after they did that task, the subjects who were primed in that way went on to, to expend more effort in the task that in this case had to do with making more money. You know, they were given a certain amount of money for, for uh, some kind of um, process they had to go through, whatever. All right, so, um, so they also found, and this is cool, this, again, this is what um, Custer's and Art's uh, report um, in, in their review. They found that this priming effect doesn't just relate to, to kind of these words and these examples, it also is, can be activated through environmental cues, through cues that, that take place, you know, in the environment around the people. For example, <laughs> they would have subjects walk into a room where there was a desk and there was a leather briefcase on the desk. In those instances, the, the subjects on the, the task that they were observed after that were um, were more competitive. They were more competitive than the, the group that walked in and didn't see the um, the briefcase on the on the desk. Another example: uh, subjects were um, led into a room and um, and led into conversation. And on the wall of this room, there was a, a picture of a library. Okay, that's with one group. With the other group, there was no picture of a library. When they found that. The subjects in the room where there was a, a picture of a library spoke more softly than the subjects that didn't, weren't exposed to this. Again, this is like, you know, this is showing how stuff that we're not even aware of is actually influencing what we do. Now, naturally, if you would have asked, you know, these people about like with the leather briefcase study or the talking softly why they did that, they would, they would invariably say, well, I did that of my free will. You know, I freely willed to choose softly. And again, the importance of this research is it's showing that no, the reason they talk more softly, the reason they were more competitive was because of these environmental cues, this priming. Okay, a third, a third example they cite, um, subjects, two subjects, groups of subjects are um, led into a room and they're, they're, um, they're asked to clean off a table, okay? In one room, there's a strong scent of some kind of a cleaning agent, you know, Ajax or bleach or whatever. Um, in the other 
with the other uh, subjects there isn't. They found that with the subjects that had this stronger aroma of cleaning agent, they cleaned the table much more thoroughly. Again, this, 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 this research is clearly refuting kind of the idea that, that we freely choose what we do. In other words, like, these are like small examples. And, and these two examples, they're just like, what, a leather briefcase, a library picture, some cleaning, the, the odor. Now, you have, to, you have to understand that when we go through our days, you know, the level of light, the temperature, who's in the room, who's not in the room, how we felt, what we ate, we're like... We, we have so many kinds of influences that act in the same way as the primes in, in these experiments. So like for someone to say that they're choosing anything, that they're choosing to do whatever they do, whether it's clean a table, talk softly, be competitive, whatever, freely, you know, free of influences that they're not in control of, you know, it just shows why free will is an illusion. It shows why, you know, what we do is really not up to us. It's up to all this stuff that, that affects us. Again, how, why, uh, how this paper is demonstrating that we're not even aware of. You know, that, that's the key point. Okay. Now, um, here's another thing. Now, with, this, with the studies that Custers and Arts just, you know, reviewed that I just went through, the subjects were consciously aware, you know, they're not deciding consciously, but they're aware of this stimuli. You know, they're aware of the leather briefcase. They're aware of the words of, that say win and achieve and all, okay, consciously. So then the research w wanted to, wanted to, to um, explore, all right, what happens if we present stimuli to these subjects that they're not aware of? In other words, like in science, um, you can present subject, for example, words, you can flash words on a screen that flash by so quickly that the person is not consciously aware of having seen them, but the unconscious um, is aware. So that's what they do. They, they, um, they conducted these same priming kinds of experiments with subliminal cues, okay? Cues under the level of conscious awareness and the, these unconscious subliminal priming studies revealed the same kinds of results. Okay, um, for example, with achievement words, as with the, the conscious studies, they increased the task performance. Um, when they were given drinking related words to two, two, two groups, one is, you know, has to work with words. Again, this is subconsciously. They're, I guess they're flashing the words very quickly. And one group is being flashed words that relate to, um, to fluid consumption. Okay, so what happens is like either after, I, I'm not sure, I didn't go into the details in this paper, but either during or after the experiment, the, um, the subjects who've been primed to um, unconsciously see these words related to f drinking fluids drank more of whatever they were drinking than the other group. Um, they, they flashed subliminally um, the names of signif significant others, you know, parents, um, children, spouses, friends and all. And they're like, again, this is below the level of conscious awareness with the people who who were primed subconsciously with those kinds of words in a task that they did afterwards that they were reserved doing. They were found to, to be more helpful to others than, than the groups, the, the subjects that weren't primed in that way. So again, this, and this, this subliminal priming, you know, below the level of conscious awareness, you know, affected people's responses. It activated related knowledge and uh, it inf influenced the level of control that they had in the tasks. And they didn't go into this in detail either, but they, they basically just listed the kinds of effects. Okay, so now, as with the post-hypnotic suggestions and with the, you know, the subjects who had been primed um, consciously w with the words, you know, with the, with the subliminal priming, then they asked them, well, why did you you know, uh, drink more of a certain, you know, soda or whatever. Why did you drink more coffee? And invariably, the um, subjects would invent reasons. In other words, they're just guessing. Well, and, and the thing is, like, when they're inventing these reasons, they actually believe that they're, you know, that these, you know, that this is the reason why they're doing it. Well, I was, you know, I was, I was really thirsty. I was really, you know, 
and so the idea is that they're not aware. They, they invent the reasons. They're not aware that the subliminal, unconscious um, priming that they'd gone through is actually what created their behavior. Okay. So, so after Custer's and Arts just go through a lot of this kind of, um, you know, very hard empirical evidence, irrefutable, this stuff, you can't, you know, this isn't, again, this isn't philosophy. In philosophy, you have philosophers who don't understand that if everything has a cause, and then if, if, if everything has a cause, that means that all of our decisions have a cause. If all our decisions have a cause, that means that every decision we make has a cause, and that has a cause, and that has a cause, and you have a, an ensuing causal regression that spans back to before the Earth was created. Philosophers don't get this, okay? And, and like in philosophy, they can kind of like skirt this, they can kind of like ignore it, they can present, you know, conflicting theories that just basically are nonsensical, um, but in science you can't do that, okay? Science, it has to be empirical, and that's the, the um, strength of this kind of research. Okay. So Custer's and Arts just basically present this kind of evidence, and then they go into the mechanism. Now, I'm not going to deal too much with the mechanism for how they do it, because basically what, they're gonna, um, what they were going into is like what the, the, the unconscious structures were. Um, again, the, at, at this point, it's important to just realize the key thing is that regardless of, of how we call the structures, what we name them, what parts of the brain are responsible or not, the key point here is that these are unconscious processes, that these, these priming processes, the, the kinds of processes that result in all of our actions and all our decisions have to be at the level of the unconscious. And the point that's relative to free will here is that like when we say we have a free will, what we're saying is we consciously decide what we're going to do or not do. We consciously decide what we're going to, what we're, you know, what we're doing um, outside of or without any kind of like control of something that's not in our, um, <laughs> without the influence, without any kind of compulsion from anything that's not in our control. Okay, now obviously, again, this is so important. If we have an unconscious that's storing all of our data, all of our memories, all of the principles we've learned, all of, all of the vocabulary, because you have to realize when we're making a decision, a lot, a lot of times we're, we're basing our decision on concepts, on linguistic concepts, all of our sense impressions. You know, all of this stuff is in our unconscious mind. By definition, we're not aware of our conscious mind, okay? That's, the, that's why they call it the unconscious. So again, if you have all this data upon which we're basing any and every decision in the unconscious, the second very strong conclusion you have to reach, and again, this is aside from any kind of mechanism, the ne neurology, the, the physical structures of the brain, is that in principle, if we're not conscious of, of, of that, of our unconscious, that means that the process of deciding has to also be at the unconscious level. Think about this. This is very important. If all of the data that we're basing the decisions on is in the unconscious, and the unconscious by definition is not accessible by the conscious mind, consciousness being only awareness, uh, and the, the unconscious basically deciding when it wants to make us aware of what's in it, if, if the unconscious is actually what the only part of our brain that can access the data in the unconscious, obviously, clearly, and very strongly, it's the unconscious that's deciding everything we do, everything we think, everything we, we perceive, I suppose. And then once it decides that, because again, it, it only has access to the data, then it makes our conscious mind aware of its decision. That's why we call it consciousness. In other words, consciousness is awareness, it's not decision making. Okay, again, very, very important point. Um, so, all right, so um, Custer's and Arts, their mechanism, in describing the me this mechanism for unconscious goal pursuit, um, they basically outline basic features that I've kind of like gone through in, on our show, I explained them in different ways. They, the basic features of goal pursuit that they describe are the consideration of the possible outcome, 
consideration of the attainability of the goal and the consideration of the value of the outcome. In other words, with the first two, you know, the past possible outcome of whatever they're going to decide or do and the attainability, that's really what I've described in the past as a reason experiment. In other words, does it make sense? You know, um, for example, if I want to pour a liquid into two glasses and I see like that there's too much liquid uh, for one of the glasses is smaller, I'm obviously going to pour it into the other one. Okay, and why would, why would I do that? Or like, what's the value of something like that? You know, if I'm going to drink the liquid, then it has some kind of a pleasure, you know, um, avoiding pain kind of value. So basically, what, what Custer's and Arts is demonstrating in this research is this kind of stuff, you know, this, these kinds of like basic features that, that are, are um, basic to all of our goal pursuits, before this research was done and conducted, um, it was pretty much concluded that this stuff was happening at the level of the conscious mind. And again, I just explained how that's impossible. That's how they concluded. Anyhow, but the, so the importance of this research is it shows, no, that this kind of, um, these kinds of processes, you know, outcome, attainability, value, are done at the level of the unconscious. I mean, I, I could say can be done, but again, like if I say can be done at the level of the unconscious, that would be kind of like leading you to believe that they could also be done at the level of the consciousness. But again, if you if you understood my explanation of how consciousness is only awareness, how the unconscious is the only part of our brain, our mind that has access to the data upon which to decide any kind of goal, then you understand how the all this um you know all these basic features of goal pursuit have to be done at the level of the unconscious as shown by this research so it's not that the the unconscious can do it the unconscious has to must you know make these goals and then it makes our conscious mind aware okay so i, I just want to go briefly into their um mechanism for the unconscious goal pursuit um the uh, ideo Ideal meter principle is involved. Um, in other words, like with Lebed, it, it showed, you know, in, in terms of muscle response, the ideal motor principle, it, it's basically that, like, when let's, if we throw a baseball or something, okay, we don't have to think of of every of moving every muscle of our arm you know to make it go a certain way or all we are our muscles have muscle memory this is like unconscious stuff so like basically these are habitual motor responses if we if you throw a ball a few times then like you don't have to think about it consciously your unconscious kind of like just knows what to do knows how to guide the muscles so so um custers and arts are applying the same principle and they're saying that this works at the level of the unconscious, not just in these simple motor tasks, but in more complex tasks um, that, um, <coughs> that they went through. And another thing that I, I just want to um, briefly go through, this, this paper um, reviews not only literature that pertains to pursuing goals, it actually also goes, to, goes through the literature, the research, that shows that the unconscious sets the goals, okay? Because in a lot of this priming research, you know, the goal has been set by the uh, researchers, but again, they research, they uh, review research that demonstrates that this, that um, our unconscious also creates these kinds of goals. Okay, um, so and again, for in terms of the mechanism that, that they um, theorize, this is um, a bit more empirical, a bit more substantive. Um, they, they cite neuroimaging research that suggests that people can process reward value of tasks unconsciously and they, they attribute these processes to the limbic system structures like the nucleus accumbens and the ventral straight, straight, stratum, I don't know. So again, for the purpose of this show, you know, you know the, the physiology of the unconscious processes involved isn't so very important. They, they go through it in their, in their paper, but basically the main point is that they're demonstrating that the, it's the unconscious that is deciding what we generally think we're deciding consciously. Okay. Um, all right, conclusion. Um, again, this is a landmark paper. Nothing had ever been uh, published 
in a journal, a science journal, as prestigious as science, the journal of science before, and it's revolutionary. And, um, you know, the fact, for example, like, you know, I did my meetup in 2010, a few months before this came out, actually, um, in April. This, uh, you know, this paper came out in July. And because it's a science weekly, my guess is like they, they might have been waiting for a time. You know, I don't know when uh, Custers and Arcs submitted the paper, because a lot of times when you submit a paper like this to a journal, it takes months, you know, for it to be published. And my guess is that like because of my meetup, because my meetup, like, you know, based in Manhattan, you had a lot of people seeing it, a lot of people coming across it as they looked for meetups in Manhattan. And so I would guess, I would, I would hypothesize that, that uh, my meetup kind of probably maybe <laughs> led to the Science Journal you know, publishing the, their paper at this time. But then you have to understand, like, they're having published it. And then like um, the shows that, that I did this show, this is like episode, I don't know, 80 something. And we do, we've been doing our Manhattan show um, that's produced by now for a year now. It's on every Wednesday. It's a live show, a live debate show. And because of this, you know, the interest is, it's, you know, again, bef before, before this kind of research, this question of human will, conscious will, free will, was pretty exclusively in the domain of philosophers. I mean, I can't, I mean, like, you also have to, like, understand that, like, physics invariably has to go into this because, like, we're physical creatures, and if, even if you were like to um, describe our thoughts as being spiritual, just the fact that they take place in a moment in time means that um, that they occupy, you know, that they're law, um, governed by the laws of physics. So basically, um, even and, and the physics, you know, we've got to get into this in others that we have, but the idea is like neuroscience this this psychology and the neuroscience sam harris's book this is this is research that's much easier for people to understand and that's the significance of this paper that they presented you know a a, a vast collection of empirical data demonstrating that our decisions are made at the level of the unconscious and then we become consciously aware of our decisions we make up reasons for what we did you know, not realizing what the re real reasons are, and that's why it's such a landmark paper. Okay, um, that's it. I think we've covered it. Um, again, I'm posting the the link to this paper on my um, on my website and also on the YouTube videos when I upload to the internet. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time.